thanks so much for coming out here on a rainy Tuesday night. So many familiar faces that I was really not that close to. Uh, anyways, uh, you guys have come out for uh, every spring a parade down Bay Street, which was an ebook, and now it's almost the play. The ebook being almost the book. Uh, I'm not. I'm, I, this is a, a show without a category, really. Uh, and, and I don't know that you'll ever see another one quite, quite like it. So I'll give you the quick preamble. Uh, this play is best watched with your eyes closed, uh, such as what you get when you take in off-off Broadview Theater. Uh, we can't construct a set that can compete with your imagination, so we didn't try. Um, just imagine a television studio back in the 60s, uh, vivid black and white. Um, sports writers sitting around a panel, uh, old white men, we have them in abundance tonight. Uh, uh, cigars smoke down to thumb length, cigarette smoke wafting up to the studio lights. Um, Disbelief should have been checked with your coat at the door. Uh, I've said that every spring a parade down Bay Street is where fantasy sport meets delusion, and and you'll you'll quickly pick this up as we uh, as we go along. Uh, two things that I'll mention uh, right up front. There is an opportunity during the show to refresh your drink, or have a smoke what you will. Uh, there, there are commercial breaks in this show. <laughs> and and they're, they're vintage commercials. Uh, and at the end of events, as if this isn't trouble enough, um, we are actually going to do a phone-in section of the show. <laughs> so what I'll need you to do is to step up here, I'm going to ask for, I think we'll probably do three callers at the end of the show. Anyone who has a question based on the show uh, can step up here and I'll manage your call. Um, anyways, uh, enjoy, or if you can't enjoy, humor us. Thank you very much. from our state-of-the-art studio in Agent Court on the far outskirts of Toronto. It's a special edition of the Sports Hot Seat. Red York of the Toronto Telegram takes center stage for questions surrounding his controversial memoir. <coughs> Every spring a parade down Bay Street, an eyewitness account of the Toronto Maple Leafs 51 straight Stanley Cups. <laughs> Your host, is CFTO Sports Director, Johnny Esau. Greetings to one and all tuning in to once again in glorious black and white. My guest is an old uh, friend, a fixture on press row at Maple Leaf Gardens, Red York. And Red, uh, you've been a lead columnist, John. Lead columnist. <laughs> yeah, upper right hand corner, front page of the section. Prime real estate, a true circulation driver, as they say in the trade. Okay, Red, uh, have it your way. You've been the lead columnist at the telly since 1967. Yes, upper right-hand corner these days, I believe, the upper right-hand corner of page 7 of the sports section. Uh, this is the first time we've invited you on the sports hot seat, now in its 54th season on the air. Well, I can understand your desperate push for ratings. Why not start at the top? Budget restraints, Red, so we had to settle for you. Red, you joined the Telegram back in February 1967. Recruited, John. Recruited. 
Yes, a talent search that really went nationwide. Well, so you, you gave notice at the Manitoulin Expositor and uh, at the Nickel Mine in Sudbury, uh, where you picked up weekend shifts and then joined the Telegram. Truly honored to work at Canada's greatest newspaper. As a copy boy, and a month later, you're a columnist covering a team on a run to the Stanley Cup. Well, there's no keeping a good man down. Not when a fire in the newsroom tragically claims the lives of the seven award-winning sports writers, virtually the entire staff of the Telegram sports section. Oh, well, if we could have a moment of silence, for those nine men who lost their lives in the blaze. And the other two, uh, according to the autopsies, one had already died before the blaze of alcohol poisoning. According to witnesses, when the burns reached his vodka-soaked liver, he went off like a box of Roman candles. The other trampled to death. The coroner found an imprint across the deceased neck that matched your size 11 Oxford. Uh, like I say, you can't keep a good man down. <laughs> yes, John. I must admit, with all the sincerity I can muster, my first column filed in the wake of the tragedy was stained with tears. Likewise, uh, the first paycheck with your bump in pay, I'm sure. But I digress for what I'm sure will be the first of many times. Read, I've read most of every spring uh, parade down Bay Street, and I came away uh, a bit early, I'll admit, with one question. What on earth possessed you to write this, uh, this book? Well, Johnny, that's high praise indeed, and I, I thank you for the <laughs> spirit it was given. <laughs> but Johnny, I, I feel blessed, blessed to have the good fortune smile on me on a couple of counts. One, a chance to work well into five decades with the finest newspaper in all of Christendom, the Toronto Telegram, which is, if this is possible, even more vibrant today, here in the year 2017. 2018, right? It's 2018. More vibrant than it was now, back in 1967, when I landed the most prestigious job in our trade, lead sports columnist at the Toronto Telegram. And two, I just happened to come along on the occasion of the emergence of the greatest dynasty in the history of sport, the Toronto Maple Leafs the team that has defined the greatest of cities. Forgive me, John, it's at moments like this I, I feel overcome. Me likewise, although for entirely different reasons. Red, you're probably aware some have called into question the accuracy of some of the facts in your memoir. Well, Johnny, yes. I mean, I can guarantee there are numerous re revelations brought to light in every spring of parade down Bay Street. I suppose a few people, those who like to think of themselves as my peers, will look for a nick or a cut here and there that they can hang their criticism on. Johnny, you have to understand, I was there for history being made, and they, sadly, were not. Is it true several publishers took a pass on your memoir, such that is? Oh, obviously, by reason of demand and their ability to print enough copies. Some publishers voluntarily removed themselves from my consideration, and for that, I thank them. Well, the reviews have been mixed. Uh, many are, are critical and the rest wholly derisive. Uh, Scott Young wrote, uh, It's the first hockey book where before chapter two I felt obliged to invoke the mercy rule. Scott was a good man. I understand that after the folding of the globe, he found work at the Coles on Young Street, stocking shelves with his son. Well, a number of uh, grieved parties think you're taking the opportunity to settle old scores. Notably, the family of the late Ted Reeve has been uh, vocal in your taking down of the old owner. Such accusations uh, wound me. I'd never say an unkind word about Ted. I mentioned him at least once in the dedication of the Red, Red York Arena at Maine and Girard. Yes, <laughs> perhaps. 
But it seems you mentioned him several times when you called the police with a tip about Reeves' former basement boarder, a member of the infamous bank-robbing Boyd gang. And according to police authorities, your inside information implicated Reeves, and he wound up nearly convicted as a, an accessory in the flight of a criminal. Oh, I'm too modest to accept much praise for an act of <laughs> civic mindedness. Reeves' legal fees bankrupted him, and then you inherited his position as sports editor. Opportunity not. On top of that, you bought Reeves' house in the beach, a pretty prime piece of real estate itself. Well, now that it's been updated. Pretty good for a kid who had uh, been fetching coffee and changing typewriter ribbons for the telegram staff, staff writers. You had been making minimum wage until six months before you bought that house. I've done well in the market. <laughs> so I've heard. You're the only guy I know who's, who's made money on Briex. <laughs> uh, the key to business is the same as the key to sport. Well, what's that, Red? Oh, uh, well... What's, what's that, Red? Timing. <laughs> timing. Sorry. <laughs> no. What's that, Red? <laughs> timing. Got it. Back to the Reeves home. By the mourner's account, the deal for his house was signed the day when the Boyd gang was captured and the loot from the bank jobs was never recovered. Well, that might have been a secret Reeves took to his grave. I can safely say Ted Reeves' grave is the one place police uh, needn't have not looked. Uh, he died penniless. Yes, sad. He had once been my mentor, my champion in the newsroom. But there's only so much you can do to him, I, I mean for him. Red, you're known as a guy who has benefited from having friends in high places. Johnny, I have friends wherever I go. I am a trusted and loyal friend to those who can help me, and those who know me well enough not to ask for my help. Well, Red, some say things have fallen into place very neatly for you in this town because, well, Dick Beto said it best, that you were a, quote, a hayseed fresh from the Manitoulin expositor who on bended knees knew precisely whose derriere to smooch or whatever it took. I'll admit, many had to take the stairs or the ladder while I took the elevator. And Dick, sadly, well, he slid down the greased pole. <laughs> While Dick was working in the media, gosh, you'd have to go all the way back to 67, back when the Globe and Mail shuttered their doors. Dick's fine sense of irony occasionally betrayed an envy of talent. In this case, his wine became vinegar. He should be thankful. When he came to me in his hard times, I got him that job at the Carlton Street newsstand. Now, I know it was only weekends and nights, but it was a front foot in the door. No doubt a foot in the door that you slammed. Let's move past your unexplainable rise in the ranks onto the Maple Leafs. Ah, the greatest franchise in sports history. Well, people say that you let Harold Ballard off lightly in this book. How can you take a man to task when his team, team wins the cup every spring? I know some were robbed the wrong way by Mr. Ballard. So it is with any man who speaks truth plainly. He and I are kindred spirits. Well, that's a point we can agree on, however unintentionally you offer it. But this idea of Pal Hal being a civic-minded guy instead of a, a pure prophet. Johnny, I wouldn't sit still for the slander of a friend if I didn't have a book to promote. Is there any truth to the word going around that this book, because that's the only way I can describe it, was authorized and paid for by Harold Ballard while he was alive, according to what I've heard? What you're offering up here is along the lines of a contractual obligation. John, my obligation is to the readers of the telegram and the truth. Anything else? Well, I can refer you to my lawyer. Well, Red, uh, we're out of the gate and we're uh, bouncing off the rail heading to the first turn. We'll be back in a couple of minutes after a word from our sponsors, surely the highlight of this show so far. <laughs> Bluetooth technology was an emerging science. To the Lord Mayor, to the coachman, take your wages and be gone. I want a better driver, for I'm going to see the Queen. Sir John, I am the finest driver you have ever seen. Join our jovial innkeeper, John Hewer, with Barb A. K. Turner and the Carlton Show Band every week at the Big Whistle for songs, dances, laughter, and infectious good humor. Joins the fun of the big 
Pick and Whistle every week on CTV. to CFTO's Sports Hot Seat with Johnny Esau and, Canada, and Canada's top sports reporters. The man on the hot seat tonight, Red York, longtime columnist of the Toronto Telegram, and the reporter on the scene for this most storied moment. dry your eyes. Yes, if you're even a casual hockey fan, or for that matter, a citizen of Toronto, by now accustomed to the annual traffic holdups caused by the blockages in the city core, you know what happened in the years since George Armstrong's goal back in May 67. Yes, it's 52 consecutive Stanley Cup triumphs. There have been highs, and there have been even higher highs. <laughs> There have been dominant teams that ran through the playoffs undefeated. There have been others, a few, that stumbled along the way. Lo, who can forget dropping the first three games to the Cleveland Barons, only to roar back when all seemed, seemed lost. <laughs> but enough of reminiscences. Let's return to the hot seat, where Johnny and his guest, Red York, are joined by Milt Dunham. <laughs> the esteemed columnist for the Toronto Star, up until the newspaper's untimely demise in 1968. <laughs> Milt, it's great to have you aboard. I'm going to throw it over to you like a live grenade. Well, Red, great to have you here. We meet again. I'm sorry, do I know you? I mean, you do look vaguely familiar. Oh yes, the Star, was it? So long ago, so many very average journalists <laughs> go to work by a lack of vision in the nation's centennial year. Your position as a publicist with the City Works Department, uh, is that keeping your kids fed? Your concern about the Dunnell's welfare is duly noted. Whatever floats your gloat. Excuse me, did Ron McLean just walk in? <laughs> Red, I'm wondering about your position on labor matters with regard to the Leafs and the rest of the NHL. I believe my position on this has been consistent. Well, the most point, polite coinage is management's mouthpiece. Some, uh, some others are more direct and not suitable for a family broadcast. Yes, most of this, most in this biz are shameless, and the rest of us work at the Telegram, Milton. It's only commonsensical. <laughs> Worldly matters have no place in the sacred house of sports. Maybe elsewhere state and religion intersect, but not in Toronto. A players' union would be a violation of that holy place. Maple Leaf Gardens. Yes, it was uh, Harold Ballard that put the howl in hallelujah. Read various levels of government 
see things differently. The rest of the NHL abides by labor laws that are long established. Teams have been operating under collective agreements that were negotiated between ownership and the players, yet you argued for the Leafs' exemption from labor legislation, basically not allowing players to organize. With due respect, argue understates it. I believe my voice on this issue was crucial to the City of Toronto's victory on the issue. It was Prime Minister Bob Stanfield who famously said, when we lose Red York, we've lost Canada. That quote ran in 48 point type across the top of the sports page that day. You get all the respect you're due and significantly, if implausibly, more than that. And Red, Prime Minister Stanfield maintains his quote was taken out of context. I'm inclined to trust the man on that. He suggests he said it was you were up on the Parliament Hill tour and you got separated from your tour group. Red, Toronto is the most labor-unfriendly environment in all of the civilized world and most of the yet-to-be-civilized world. How can you possibly justify this? Well, a little background for those who live outside this city, the city limits of this magical burg. When Pope Paul came here to the former, t former town of York in 67 and beheld its wonder in the wake of that seminal Stanley Cup victory, he could declare Toronto a World Heritage Site. An irony not lost in a half-wit, the Roman Catholic Pontiff opens up an opportunity for your friends in the Orange Road of Toronto to profiteer unconscionably. Providence, if you're inclined to believe in that hocus-pocus stuff. Nonetheless, it allowed the city fathers to take the case through the court system. The Supreme Court made the fairest decision when it upheld Toronto's status as a historically protected site in its entirety and a distinct society. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Historical protection means no new buildings or adaptation of existing edifices and infrastructure can be undertaken. Self-determination is part and parcel of that. Values, dress codes, and mores are today as they were in 67. <laughs> we are the emergency break against runaway progress. Who needs, who has needs for color TV? I mean, never mind these computerized gadgets. When we speak of heritage as uh, Pope, uh, Pope Paul, Pope Paul. Yes, when we speak of heritage as Pope Paul did, we're talking about history. Correct me if I'm wrong. We don't have enough time to correct you when you're wrong. <laughs> it's only an hour show. <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, but ancient Rome had no unions and no minimum wage, did it? No, there was not much call for minimum wage with slavery. Precisely. <laughs> and so, like the chattel being thrown in the pit with the lions, the Leafs get mere honorariums. Well, I don't identify the Leafs with the slaves, Milk. I see them as the lions. The lions in ancient Rome killed because they were hungry. And because they were lions. At least Emperor Nero allowed spectators into the forum for free. And there the parallel must end. You have to keep up with the times, Mel. Whenever it's convenient for you. But look, there are millions in revenues and Harold Ballard and later the Ballard Family Trust has taken in more than its fair share while the Leafs have to hold down day jobs. And that's the stuff that makes the spirit of sport, isn't it? Self-sacrifice, commitment, giving it your all. While well, ownership gives nothing at all. Uh, thanks for your incisive questions, Milta. I know it, it can't be easy. City Works just called and needs a notice sent out that trash removal will only be three days a week starting post-haste. <laughs> Tempted to say that Red could catch a ride to the work in one of those trucks. His columns, though, he'd have to hold off until those days designated for hazardous waste. Our next panelist is known to all our viewers, a longtime stablemate of yours at the Toronto Telegram, the Baron himself, George Gross. <laughs> Hello, George. Wonderful, wonderful to have you aboard. Douglas, were it not for me, you'd, you'd be the best known sports writer in Toronto and the one who most directly played a role in the Leafs glory run. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Wonderful to be here. I was just on the phone to the great Pele, wanting him to drop the puck opening night tomorrow at Maple Leaf Garden. Arguably the world's best known athlete who isn't a Toronto Maple Leaf. Precisely, Red. I want to ask about you and Punch Imlach in 67. Ah, <laughs> oh, man, I would call my mentor if the lines could be so cleanly drawn. A dear, dear friend. 
I need the version. <laughs> version? 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 <laughs> no, dumb cough. Version. Is Vaughn I can pronounce. I need the version you told of 67. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you, George. There might be a few discrepancies in the German or Czech translations of uh, Every Spring a Parade Down Bay Street. So I'll be happy to clear up exactly how the great run started and detail my large, if uncelebrated, role in that first championship. <laughs> Perhaps a reading from the tone itself would be appropriate. At this point, there's no scaring off remaining viewers. <laughs> I still smelled of smoke from the great telegram fire when I lugged my typewriter up to the tiny cup press cubby hole at Maple Leaf Gardens for my first game on the Leaf Beat, March 1, 1967, a game with the spectacular Robert Marvin Hull, as well as bad boy Stanislaus Gout, a.k.a. Stan Makita. Yes, it was the Chicago Blackhawks visiting our town. Somehow fitting, I thought. <sighs> Just as the Hawks were the opponents that first night, when the gardens opened in 1931, so should they be the visitors to the hockey shrine the night I made my debut as the Telegram's lead man on the Maple Leaf beat. Having safely installed myself on press row an hour before game time, I noticed that Robert Marvin had skated over to the bench and was autographing programs and scraps of paper for a few kids. I decided this might be an opportunity to buttonhole him and get an exclusive right out of the blocks. Hull says 54 goals, an unbreakable number. Curved blades now, curved shafts next, or something like that. <laughs> I mean, I understand this is the first NHL game that I'd ever worked, the first one I had ever attended. Given the poor television reception in the Canadian Shield in my youth, I had only ever watched games through the front window of McAllister's electronics store in Little Current. <laughs> Thus I could have been forgiven for not knowing about the etiquette of such events, that a reporter was supposed to chase down the news in the wake of action. I had always been an ambitious reporter, and never one to put off until later what might best might be done right away. So I walked down through the grays, greens, and blues, and right up to the Chicago bench with my notebook in hand and a borrowed fedora. Uh, thanks for that, George. <laughs> it was from the last effects of Bob Pennington <laughs> that we didn't auction off for the Christmas charity fund. A souvenir he brought from, back from St. Andrews when he was covering George Knudsen at the British Open. <laughs> we had a hat display for the memorial to Bob in the newsroom. Every day, we would leave a cup of Earl Grey and a shortbread cookie in front of it. <laughs> Oh, a borrowed fedora perched precariously on top of my head. I waited at the end of the autograph line for an audience with the golden jet. I noticed that he avoided looking at me. Understandably, he feared an interrogation, no less, no less than a date with John Ferguson. When I reached the front of the line, I tried to ask him a question, but no words came out, just hiccups. Hull grabbed my notebook and pen, scrawled Bobby Hall number nine, slapped me on the back and said, get better, kid. <laughs> I picked up my fedora just after Makita stepped on it and started the climb back to the press box. My hiccups lasted throughout the game, easing only slightly, and were going to last well into the wee hours of the night. For that tilt, Imlac had assigned the master of mayhem, Eddie Shack, to Pester Hall, and it worked like a charm. On a couple of Chicago power plays, Bob Pulford and Leonard Kelly shut down Hull and even goaded Makita to take a couple of impest impetuous penalties. Final score, Toronto 3, Chicago 1. A seemingly ordinary game, but not for your faithful correspondent up in the press box. One minute into the first period, the E, -E key of my typewriter snapped off. There was no repairing it without a soldering iron. If it had been the X or the Z, I could have sol soldiered on. An E, though. Dave Keehan would have become Dav Khan. It would have been unacceptable for the teletype transmission. So at the end of the game, I raced down to a payphone and dialed the telegram's desk. Get me rewrite, honey, I said for the first time. Speaking. Oh. The most pleasant feminine voice I had ever heard. 
Just the sound of it over the Inco intercom would have my old crew of miners tightening their grips on their picks. I puzzled over this response, presuming I would be passed over to a fellow wearing a green visor and chewing on a stogie. Most of you know the rest of the story, retold in my annual Valentine's Day columns. Oh, and once by Paul Harvey. So I'll only give the thumbnail version. This became my ritual for the next 42 years, right through the newfangled modernization. Now, years ago, our bosses saddled staffers with IBM Selectrix. Luckily, I dodged that encumbrance, and the program was soon abandoned. Those god-awful worrying slabs of metal, they led to sloppy writing and monumental electric bills. <laughs> well, I've dialed the rewrite desk nightly for 51 years, never missing a game. A harder way to work, but worth the effort. And the voice on the other end of the line at night belonged to Miss Scarlet Honey. And it was she who ended up becoming Mrs. Red York, my partner on this glamorous ride. <laughs> right. There's, there's no studio audience. Oh, quite right. Yes, I believe the floor director left for the station infirmary. I would be remiss if uh, the first woman to win a national newspaper award for sports writing. And also the first winner in any category working on the rewrite desk. This might be a good, if long overdue, time to take a commercial break. We'll be back in a couple of minutes, and please don't hold it against our sponsors. <laughs> Happy to have as our first guest, the coach and general manager of the Leafs, Punchy Michael. Punchy, we're going into the dressing room. Uh, do you speak to them as a group or as individuals or what? Well, usually I use a uh, group uh, idea. Once in a while I get mad and then I go to the individual, but most of it uh, is usually done as a group and let them take out uh, what they think this applies to them. Could you give us a little preview of what you're going to say in this group? Well, I thought that our team weren't skiing as well as what they have in the first two games, but uh, we seem to be able to uh, survive that uh, onslaught that they put at us in the first 10 minutes. They were really going at Chicago Club, and uh, I thought our team rather played well defensively, but uh, offensively we aren't skating, and I think once we start to skate, well, I think we'll be a little bit harder to handle. Punch, uh, this terrific bipartisan, or this, bi this biased crowd in Chicago, partisan crowd, do they have a tendency to affect the players to slow up a bit or not skate as hard or maybe hit as hard? Well, there has to be some uh, element, let's say, of uh, a psych psychological aspect in it, but uh, I don't really think uh, that it bothers the players. To me, it's uh, who wants to win the most is going to make the difference, and if our team wants to, to win hard enough, well, then they'll play hard enough. Punch, a lot of people feel that the Leafs are skating harder and hitting harder in this final series than they did against New York. Now, was that part of the strategy, uh, to not to make a build up to this series? Well, actually, against New York, we weren't able to hit the team that every time we tried it, we would end up in the penalty box. So, uh, and this way, well, it was better not to hit and stay out and uh, try to win the game. Because if you're in the penalty box all late, you're in trouble. You can't uh, expect to win. Punch, once the game... We're back. Hard as it is to believe. Hard as any of this is to believe. Uh, Red, reading excerpts from books like yours really doesn't make for scintillating TV, so... Well, John, if you insist, at the risk of scooping myself, I'll read one of my favorite passages from the book. A favorite of my thousands of readers. The honest account of a stirring moment when I realized that my column was not a job, but my noble calling, one for which I was divinely serendipitously, easier to write than it is to say, serendipitously <laughs> selected. <laughs> you lost me at honest, but go ahead. I'll have to have a little assist from your caddy. Indeed. I went down to the Leafs dressing room after that game and introduced myself to Coach Imlach. Mr. Imlach, I'm Red York, the Telegram's new man on the Leafs beat, I said. Son, welcome aboard. Imlach said generously, shaking my hand in a hearty affirmation of his sincerity. It's been kind of lonely around here since all those other papers went out of the biz. 
gosh, I used to have paper roots in Riverdale growing up. All those other papers, the Star, the Globe and Empire, well, you couldn't give them away. I always had a soft spot for the late lamented colleagues at the Telegram. Please extend my condolences to the widows. It was, so, it was not something I'd wish on my worst enemy, or even Toe Blake. I'll never, I'll never forget those words and that moment. He looked skyward and winked his way of offering his best wishes to those departed telegram men. Son, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about this team and the game. Oh, I'm a skeptical sort. Reporters by nature and trade, they are. We're well aware of the dangers of becoming too close to our subjects. This, however, was a different matter. The gruff exterior and combative postures taken by Coach Imlach during games, and at times in the public eye, were just his way of compensating for a soft and generous nature. I recognize that he, as a man, was an open book who would feel obliged to tell me nothing but the truth. It was just one of those things I knew intuitively, having become an expert judge of character in my many stops and varied experiences that led me to the press box in the first place. Most hockey players are not good square types. Coach Imlach spake. He then pointed to the Leaf dressing room. But you'll never find a more forthright bunch of young men as those in our barracks. Other teams have curfews and bed checks and that sort of thing. Not us. All I ever worry about is them getting up too early for church on Sunday, perhaps spreading themselves too thin with all that charity work. And you know what? When someone comes over from another team, he sees how this operation goes and he falls into place. It's not just a good group, but it saves them from would-be bad apples to boot. If I had to go to war, I'd want these players beside me, even Shacky. I might not know what he's going to do next, but neither would the enemy. These fellows know they have a chance to skate into history, and they're going to take it. They know that once they play for this team, they will always be part of this family. I wouldn't trade a one of them if you put a gun to my temple. Leafs for life, that is truly what I believe. That talk of me wanting to sell Frank Mahovlich to the Hawks for a million dollars, Complete fiction. I'd rather cut off my arm than have him wear a Chicago sweater for a single game. How could I let this young man go, given all that he's done for us? Seeing his father sharpening skates over at Leaside Arena. Heck, I used to skate there. I'd never be able to go back and show my face. I would do this job for nothing if I could afford to, just to have a chance to play a role in the lives of this group. I tingled. I knew I was on the cusp of greatness. I could see the trainers and ushers biting their lips and turning away. So moved were they by that moment. Fred, I too am moved, not exactly like you, a matter I can address with a quick bathroom break. No doubt, a feeling shared by those unlucky enough to be tuned in right now. John, I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. You won't have to reach too far down. Red, time doesn't allow us to dwell too much on the year-by-year -year progress of the Leafs. Surely I could spend an hour on Odd Erickson's overtime goal in the seventh game of uh, Cup Final over the Golden Seals back in 69 alone. And you would be alone at the end of that hour. But rather than hopscotching all the way through, I, I'd rather focus on a few of the big topics of then and now. And one of these has been your coverage of the NHL in this market. Red, I'm sure you're not deaf to your critics. I'm sorry, I missed that. Come again? <laughs> you couldn't have helped but hear the snide comments uh, made about your godding up of the Maple Leafs? You'll have to speak up, John. I'll cite an example for you. This, this was uh, Mr. Red Fisher of the Montreal Gazette. <clears throat> A self-styled rival in the same sense that the lowly Canadians could ever be considered a rival for the most storied team in the game, a franchise that literally drips class. Or some other bodily fluid, but no matter, this is what Mr. Fisher, who is not, I must remind you, a member of the Professional Hockey Writers Association in good standing, must be some sort of stone age axe to grind. Uh, 
This is what Mr. Fisher wrote about your coverage. A quote, as a vessel of information for the public, York works for a fittingly named outlet. He is to hockey journalism what the telegram is to communication. Outmoded, a museum place, a curiosity of a bygone age, and the quality of his prowess is uh, in, in some sense purely telegraphic. Uh, perhaps uh, readable in the end, but only after decoding. They say that history repeats itself, and it's true, the first time as tragedy, the second time as farce, and the third time as Red York's game story. <laughs> Fisher, as ever, equivocating. A real man would have had the fortitude to shoot straight. Next time you're at the forum, I, I wouldn't hand him a gun. Uh, Fisher goes on. I'm sure he does. Fisher writes, quote, York's inexplicable longevity, I dare not call it success, rides on parallel rails. One, the gullibility of the marks who make up the Leafs faithful, and two, and arguably the newspaper industry's best rewrite desk. <laughs> Nightly, they take dead fish that wash up on the beach and somehow serve up sushi. Envy distilled. Years of crushing disappointments with that fully eclipsed franchise in Montreal would leave a good man and would leave a good man embittered. Never mind Red Fisher. Further from Red Fisher, quote, York is simply the player's mouthpiece, accent on simply, like the dentures that sit in a glass of water on George Armstrong's nightside table. <laughs> York would have you believe Kevin McGuire actually deserves a place in the Hall of Fame. I can assure you that McGuire deserves his plaque. As chairman of the Hall of Fame Selection Committee, I counted the ballots. Some have said that you more than count the ballots. Some have called for transparency in the selection process, like in baseball. Well, what is important for our Hall of Fame is getting the right men. Without any outside scrutiny, we're at liberty, liberty to vote with our consciousness, consciences. <laughs> and without in undue influence. Red, you actually select all the hockey men who sit on the committee and they are entirely LEAF alumni. <laughs> all candidates are given a fair hearing and due consideration. There has been a push for greater representation for other teams in the league. Or any. Well, we're working on a white paper looking into it. It should be tabled next year or the year after. And then sealed and stamped as classified as would be entirely appropriate. Red, no one is questioning the worthiness of one Dave Keon, but two? Well, David Keon Jr. has made an enormous contribution to the league. <laughs> Doubtless that he has been the best penalty timekeeper of the era. Maybe if you tune out the coaches who say visiting teams serve minor penalties that run two minutes and 30 seconds. Seriously, though. The Hall of Fame, uh, the list of Leafs mediocrities goes on. Mirko Freacher, Mike Craig, Vesa Toskala, Denny Dupere, Ernie Godin, Greg Terry, and Jeff Ware, Claire Alexander. Alexander, the Aurelia Milkman, yes, a true gent. As I like to say, he always gave 102%. <laughs> As did Ron McLean before you. Alexander was lucky to land in a hindbound city, the only place in the world where milk trucks still operate more than a few horse drawn. He's working to this day, although I presume coming up on a well-earned retirement. At age 73, definitely well-earned and certainly underwritten by the milk company's pension plan through a quirk of Toronto's distinct society designation, the Leafs <laughs> are exempt from paying into the league pension fund. And the team requires all its players to waive any claim to all NHLPA benefits. Yes, it warms my heart. The Leafs are warriors bravely leading the resistance against creeping socialism. And at the same time, martyrs sacrificed for the Valor family's bottom line. But Red, in the matter of the Hall of Fame, no one outside our area code thinks of Norm Oban or Brandon Convery as Hall of Famers, <laughs> or even outside this studio. All you have to do is count the rings, John. They've covered themselves in glory. Okay. Let's look at specific cases then. Uh, well, one that you've been criticized about most vehemently is the Orr versus McKinney debate. <laughs> well, I don't think I'm telling tales out of school, but I really don't think Bobby Orr imagines that he on his best day was the player Jim McKinney was. Oh, 
I mean, Howie was the absolute crossover star. I mean, yes, various Leafs over the years have been named Canada's Athlete of the Year and Sports Illustrated Sportsman of the Year, but McKinney, he took the Oscar for face-off. It, it wasn't an Oscar, it was a, a Gemini, and he didn't win it, he ran onto the stage and, and took Art Hindle's statuette. Well, well deserved, too. And he might have gone away with it if he hadn't stepped or stopped to, to make an acceptance speech. Uh, Red, the fact is that uh, Bobby Orr has roundly been regarded as the greatest player who ever lived. He, he's not in the Hall of Fame. Well, over the years, his name has been kicked around the table. <laughs> but in the end, it's, not, it's the Hall of Fame, not the Hall of the Pretty Good. I mean, the McKinney versus Orr debate, well, the former is the original, and the latter in Boston is a, a very pale imitation. And Orr, while occasionally flashing some talent, I mean, he never won the big one. But right, by that criteria, no one who has played for another team in the league since 1967 can ever hope to be recognized. Well, sports is a cruel mistress, I suppose. <laughs> in the case of the Leafs in the Hall of Fame, more like an abusive husband. Uh, I suspect that Wayne Gretzky wouldn't have made it there. Well, based on his exploits with Edmonton in uh, LA, I'd have to say borderline case. And what are a couple of hundred points when your life and death to make the playoffs? I mean, but he uh, cemented his case for the Hall and secured my vote. Like anyone else's matters. Hmm. The Great One secured his spot in the Hall when he joined the truly Great Ones, the Leafs. Signed by Hall of Fame GM Cliff Fletcher. That was a sweetheart deal. It was pure exploitation and larceny. Well, I paid him over the minimum. Red, it, it paid him a couple of dollars over the minimum wage. He did a, a dollar an hour better than the ushers. Well, now the ushers, they have a most generous pension plan. That they can't start collecting on it until their 90th birthday, and, and then they're phased in. Well, that's another example of the Ballard Estate's munificence. But back to Gretzky. Well, the Brantford lad. Yes, uh, he received the market rate. Yeah, then the added value, the Honus Wagner cards that he was handed upon signing. A baker's dozen of them. Still in their wrappers and authenticated by Bruce McNall, the world's greatest card authority, as testified to in sworn court affidavits. In the authentication process, Mr. McNall used the latest in x-ray technology. Seems hardly necessary any fool could see through this or the great fire that swept through the offices at the gardens that claimed the lives of a security guard and the Honus Wagners. It was all handled by insurance investigators. A popcorn machine was accidentally left on and shorted out. Yes, all season the Leafs reeked of coconut oil. Uh, Gretzky's arrival made up for any material loss and the cost of fumigation by his play. Uh, truth be told, I thought he was pretty ordinary, aside for a few moments in his 92 goal season. I mean, I've never been a slave to numbers. I'll leave that to the accountants. And the insurance adjudicators and justice. Well, as I was saying, Gretzky managed to raise his game from high-scoring journeyman to an all-star in his 30s, an age when most fade from the scene, and, and he played what I and other hockey insiders consider his greatest game against his old team, the Los Angeles Kings. <laughs> Who can forget that great clinching game six at the Garden? It was, it was game seven. Only necessary because Bruce Hood called Wendell for a high stick that left Dave Taylor with a 12-stitch cut. It was Kerry Frazier, it was uh, Luke Robitaille who high sticked Doug Gilmore, and there was no penalty call. Well, the King's owner, Jack Kent Cook, a close friend, Owner of the, the uh, Maple Leafs AAA baseball team was crying in his beer behind the Kings bench as time wound down in that deciding game. Beer and liquor are not sold at the gardens that Jack Kent Cook had died years before. Burned in my memory, like it was yesterday. Uh, did you see my car keys around? I, I know I put them somewhere. <laughs> While we search for them, let's take a, a two minute time out to pay the bills. It, it's a 67 Cadillac, right? 68. This exciting car is the top travel award in Roadshow 67.
Its advanced design includes a rear lounge area with custom fittings like built-in games tables and a stereo sound system. Only four were built for ESO. One could be yours, complete with all the ESO products and services you need to travel Canada 67. Gasoline, insurance, the works. Just pick up your free ticket to the top of war where you see this display. Collect five different travel safety tips, answer a skill testing question, and you could be eligible for a 67X. Thousands of other awards, too. When you enjoy Roadshow 67. It's for lucky folks like you and me. Once again, your host, CFTO Sports Director, Johnny Esau. And probably we're back with Red York of the Telegram here on the sports hot seat, and I've brought back all our panelists for moral support. John, please allow me a moment to compose myself. My eyes well up just seeing him on the screen. My dear departed friend, gone too soon. Yes, too soon for the hounds from the Ontario Securities Commission to catch up to him, but evidently they're investigating the Ballard family estate. Any ties to you, Red, and, and well, I, I hear they have color television at Millhaven, although I'm sure you can adjust the picture to black and white. I would love to comment, but on the advice of my lawyers, they also put me on notice. Ditto. <laughs> In fact, all of the broadcast crew. Gentlemen, please, sirs. I happen to be counsel for Mr. York. My name is E. Victor Cheatham. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm representing Mr. York because of matters before the Ontario Security Council and further conversations with the Crown in these matters and others. Mr. York shall refrain from all comment about his finances along with those of the Ballard family estate and Maple Leaf Sport Incorporated. What he's saying, I'm making a deal. Mr. York, sir, please, not another word. When the courts open tomorrow, we will file for a quia timid injunction to block broadcast of this show as it will do irreparable harm to his ability to present a defense before an uncontaminated jury. Mr. Cheatham, the harm has seemingly been done. We're live. We're on the air. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I wasn't aware. I'm on. <laughs> not, not to worry, Brad. Even before this, what, what demonstration? All of us are, are sufficiently intimidated by your successful libel action against Dick Beddoes. Red, if I can switch away from the subject of your finances. Oh, by all means. Let, let's cast forward and move on to the, the current Leafs administration. Many were surprised by the hiring of Brendan Shanahan. I call it, as first reported in the Toronto Telegram. If, if you can call it after the fact. It was first announced in the Sunday New York Times, right? Not familiar with it. <laughs> it's a daily, right? I mean, to be perfectly honest. I'll settle for our little imperfect candor at this point. Well, I was well ahead of the news. I just wasn't at liberty to divulge it. I knew he was leaving the Manhattan offices and returning to the team that made him and his hometown, a true son of Toronto. Well, technically, he's not from Toronto. He's a son of Mimico, a borough in the unamalgamated city and said borough's mayor. For out-of-town viewers, the city's component parts were given degrees of independence back in the great disamalgamation of the 70s. Yes, Shanahan's victory speech after the vote is on side six of the three LP abridged version of Every Spring a Parade Down Bay Street, available at Sam the Record Man. Six vinyl sides with a bonus 45 of Honky the Christmas Goose, and here comes, or clear the track, here comes Shaq. Well, he benefited from a by-election called on a day's notice immediately in the wake of the Leafs' last Stanley Cup win. If it had been on Boxing Day, uh, the, the Mimiconians would have voted for Santa Claus. Well, the stars did line up for him. Pure coincidence, then, that your son Teeter is the head of the Toronto Elections Commission. <laughs> I have instilled in my sons a strong commitment to public service. The resignation of the sitting mayor of Mimico came at something as a shock. Indeed it did. At least it did until it was revealed that the former mayor had accepted a seat on the board of directors with Maple Leaf Gardens. 
Well, you can't deny a man upward mobility. As well as sole ownership of a parking lot on Church Street, far below market price. Well, to say he's a shrewd man is more than an understatement. <laughs> yes, it's not an understatement I'm smelling. There was a disgruntled, the disgruntled citizens of Mimico maintained Shanahan's bid for the mayoralty wasn't entirely civic-minded. I'm saddened by such slanders. The telegram has been surprisingly mute about Shanahan's neighbors' complaints about the two-story addition built on the Shanahan family bungalow in open defiance of the borough's zoning laws. Well, in the unerring judgment of our editors, the complaints are groundless. Petty attempts at score settling by envious neighbors, who I've heard are, to a man, fans of the Canadians. And your man muscled through the designation of said bungalow as the mayoral residence. Thus, it's exempt from property taxes. Befitting a soon-to-be historical site. Now, an Irish retail outlet flogging Aaron Sweaters, Shillelaghs, and King Clancy bobbleheads on an otherwise residential Mimico Street. To whatever extent, his home, humble birthplace was already a landmark. And who could ever forget how he came over to the Leafs from Hartford and short months later, he scored those critical goals in the wins over the Czechs and Russia to win gold for Canada at the Olympics in Japan. As I smartly quipped, our city sun rises in the land of the rising sun. <laughs> yes, John, in such great moments, I, I allow myself to wax poetic. I'd say it's more wax than poetic. Well, Shanahan has doubtlessly proven himself a canny manager in chief. Even though this string of Stanley Cup victories and near undefeated seasons, he's been able to position the club at the top of the draft and thus give the very most elite youngsters the chance of living their hockey dreams. And each taking the hometown haircut for the honor. Well, speaking of those who waited to get into the barber's chair, let's move on to more recent developments. Red, I have to admit I was stunned this summer, stunned that the Leafs signed John Tavares, such a, a talent. He had his run of the market. Well, yes, John, a lot of people dwell on matters of money. Hard not to when historically Harold Ballard spared all expense and later the present-day owners of the Ballard estate have kept up family tradition of squeezing nickels into the Queen's eyes water. Well, as chapter president of the Monarchist League, I won't sit still for such talk. Just don't mind me while I stretch my legs. Well, John, what you sadly miss is that the Leafs have cornered the market on one thing, winning. No other team can compete with them on that. It's the ultimate home ice advantage, and due credit to Tavares for taking the Leafs' seniority system as a challenge. Due respect to him for his willingness to work his way up from the fourth line. <laughs> yeah, at least with Austin Matthews around, we'll have company working that midnight shift at Friends. Red, the man has been a third-team All-Star four times in his career, and really that, that honor doesn't entirely give him his due because the 12 players on the first and second teams are all Maple Leafs, historically so, going all the way back to 1968. I actually have a motion before the Hockey Writers Association to have the option of not voting for the third team, simply because we often lack deserving candidates. Third-team All-Star. It's like kissing your cousin. I mean, I've done it, and I don't recommend it. <laughs> a thought almost too gruesome to consider were it not so entirely predictable. Milt Dunnell, do you want to take another crack at him here? If it's a condition of my honorarium, I'll gladly rejoin, well, I'll reluctantly rejoin the fray. How about Austin Matthews? To my mind, he's underperformed frequently on Hockey Night Canada broadcasts on Saturday evenings compared to his games on other nights. I've suggested he fares not so well with the spotlight shone brightly upon him. Hogwash, Milt. I mean, you've been out at the game too long. The lad's been worn out by the heavy traffic on Friday nights when Fran offers the all-you-can-eat spaghetti special. I mean, the addition of Tavares will surely take some of the workload off him. I mean, at the gardens and in the famous eatery's kitchen. I, I don't know how you could possibly be critical of him. He pulled off the never-before triple, the Calder Trophy, the Conn Smythe, 
and France Employee of the Month. <laughs> it just seems wrong. A player like Matthews to hold down a day job in order to play for the Leafs. He put in a season in Switzerland just so he could put aside money, just enough to afford for playing for a team that requires players to buy their own equipment and pay for their hotel rooms on the road, where they sleep four to a room. Well, team building, Milton. I mean, in fact, Coach Babcock has the power play share a junior suite. I mean, you've seen them cycle the puck. That really has its foundation in the quintet sharing one bathroom. As for our stars having square jobs, priorities, my friend. They are citizens of this great city first and members of the blue and white second. You know, for other franchises, community service is so much hollow talk. Not our Leafs. Red, it's a noble thing when players do community service, but another thing entirely when it's minimum wage jobs in the uh, service industry. All the more meaningful, Milton. For players and the community. It's a way to stay connected to the loyal throng and in keeping up with traditions. With time put in, will they graduate to much higher pay scales? Not on the ice. Well, of course not. Off it, my friend. This private sector, where the real money is. I mean, I remember interviewing Wendell one night. The next morning he'd be thanking me and complimenting me on my turn of phrase curbside when he stepped off the back of the city garbage truck. <laughs> and Doug Gilmore. Well, I remember him swinging by in his Royal Canadian Post outfit. <laughs> Mr. York, you're getting more fan mail than me, Dougie said. I told him, son, with great influence comes great responsibility. I answered every letter personally. Yes, and I understand all the letters you sent arrived with postage due. Any postage on self address stamps, the envelopes, the stamps are steamed off. Well, that brings us up to our last commercial break. When we come back, we'll be visited by a special guest and take questions over the phone. God bless and help you who have hung on this long. We encourage you to wait until after this broadcast to seek professional help. It's the new Beat the Clock. The game show that hits wits against time as contestant couples carry out some of the trickiest stunts ever devised. Join host Gene Wood weekdays on CTV for lots of laughter bill fun on the new Beat the Clock. David Carradine is Kwai Chang King. <laughs> Master of the deadly art of kung fu. Watch David Carradine in Kung Fu every week on this CTV station. <laughs> to chime in, Mrs. Scarlett York, a dear old friend. Ah, uh, mother of my four extraordinary sons, and the rock in my life, and thus the foundation of sports journalism in this country. Thanks for joining us here on, that, uh, on the sports hot seat. Not often that we get those of the fair sex. Yeah, and by accounts, the uh, sex is better than fair. Thank <laughs> you. Hello, boys been a while since I've seen you. We have to catch up. You know, the desk is such a lonely place. 
I, I guess with you and in red, it was a case of love breaking out in the newsroom. A real romance for you two. Catch a rising star, I always say. And when you can't, well, I can't beef. In this business, you're married to your job for better or worse. In my case, it's the latter, but at least I, I control the pay stub. Is it true that you met when you were working on the rewrite desk? Yeah, that's how we met. We talked a lot. Hours on end, every day. Occasionally about something other than his columns and some basics of grammar. When did it get serious? <laughs> I guess it was around the time that I found out he had bought Ted Reeves' house at a city auction. All cash. Red, by all the accounts I hear in, in Scuttlebutt, I'm supposing that you can only be the Telegram's second most popular employee. John, the demands of my work mean I'm not around the newsroom that much. I mean, really, Scarlett looks after the York family social commitments. She's the people person. She represents me at the Telegram social functions. Every year after the big Christmas party, I can count on answering the door where a delivery man will be waiting with flowers while Scarlett sleeps contentedly after a very late night. I mean, she does that for me. Yeah. Everything I do, you'll never know. Clearly. To this, I can vouch. Vouch? Vouch? Uh, no matter. Yes, I remember starting out at the Telegram and uh, filing my humble first columns. In no way as accomplished as I am now. Not remotely. Actually, I, I think any quality to be found there would be, would, would come remotely. But I, of course, quickly adapted it elevated my skill set, and Scarlett was there to see it as it played out daily and nightly. And I thank Doug Bassett, who might have expected that love would bloom. A bit of a matchmaker was Mr. Bassett. It was he who instructed me to file directly to the rewrite desk. A match made in heaven. And out of necessity. In luck with AK, for God's sake. But I, I believe that everyone in the business knows exactly how important Scarlett has been to your career. Thus, she was the first and only rewrite man to receive a National Newspaper Award for Lifetime Achievement. And I have never been so honored. It's true, Red. You actually never have won a National Newspaper Award. Well, I beseech my editors not to submit entries in my name, and it'd be unfair to the field. My work's at another standard. Ain't that the truth? I mean, I have won the Professional Hockey Writers Association Writer of the Year Award 21 years running. Which happened to be the term of your presidency of the association. And it was also when reporters from outside Toronto were relegated to non-voting status. Not to mention the start of my term as acting secretary. A uh, position my wife has served with distinction all these years. And served many of our peers very distinctly. <laughs> You're entirely welcome, Georges. We've always appreciated you keeping the members' minutes. My pleasure. With Red, it rarely has ever lasted a minute. <laughs> Red, there's been some question about the Professional Hockey Writers Award money. Well, a multiple of the cash for the National Newspaper Award, award it is true. Which is donated by the Ballard Family Trust. Just another instance of Hockey's First Family's community service. Or self-service. Jim Proudfoot of the long-ago Shuttered Star called it, quote, a bald kickback. Well, I'd sick my lawyer on him if he wasn't completely indigent. <laughs> but I take no joy in a royal's misery. So I'm glad he was able to land on his feet after, star sh after the star shuttering. I mean, I hear he's cleaning up these days. Yes, he's working with the Maple Leaf Gardens janitorial crew. <laughs> oh, well, Scarlett, tell us about our four sons. Well, yes, Teeter, King, Teeter. Boria, <laughs> and Mats. <laughs> and they're all strapping lads, all players of note. Yes, yeah, a testament to a good gene pool. More than you'll ever know. <laughs> and they all celebrate birthdays uh, with what? Three days in early January. Yes, nine months after the playoffs. <laughs> yeah, Red's on the road a lot. Um, I'm <laughs> trying to conceive. Yeah, it wasn't necessary. So the, the blessed events are actually... Well, yes, John. 
when I get home from the final, there's always bunches of flowers waiting for me. Delivered a day or two before my return, but no matter. Yeah, by that time they're wilting, which is quite appropriate. Oh, yeah, it's a wonderful gesture from stars who have become like family to me. I mean, you see during the Starley Cup final, uh, Scarlet tirelessly takes on alumni events. Uh, you know, the, the picture is uh, coming more clearly into view for some of us, anyway. Well, yes, the reunion is a chance to catch up with the greats. I can tell you they're heroes in every way. Some teams just retire numbers and give their players a rocking chair. I like to find other ways to honor the boys. It's a lot of long nights that I put in, but it's my favorite event of the season. Uh, and there's uh, no doubt. I think this would be an appropriate juncture to go to our separate corners. More like separate realities. For you viewers who have comments or complaints, probably more of the latter, please address your mail to letters to Sports Hot Seat, Post Office Box 49, Agent Court, Ontario. Well, that's all from us here on CFTO Sports Hot Seat this week. Thanks to Red York, his memoir is available in better bookstores for reading and fire starting. Uh, your, your kind words encourage me to keep fighting the good fight. Good night, all. We'd like to thank Scarlett. Anytime. So let's go to the phones. Uh, do we have any callers? Anyone? Shout out your name and, and where you're calling from. Assuming we still have an audience at this point. Johnny, Johnny, I believe I have Roscoe from Rexdale. Ah, a regular Roscoe from Rexdale. Good to hear from you. Actually, uh, calling from all the way in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Name's Dickie Dunn, and uh, I've been a big fan of Red for many years. In fact, I've been trying to capture the spirit of the thing for many years based on Red's inspiration. I've been reading Twitter a lot lately. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that uh, social media vehicle, but uh, a lot of them say, how do you have a job? You're, while you are, an idiot. Uh, just wondering how an icon of your stature handles that kind of scrutiny and, and pressure and criticism. Red, uh, I'm sorry, the seven second delay is important. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dickie, Dunn, I am really not aware of that uh, uh, form of communication. Something must be involving the lower orders, I'm sure. So I sail above it, as I always have, and carry on the good fight. Is that because there is absolutely no Wi-Fi where the Toronto Maple Leafs play? Wi-Fi? Hey, we have a hi-fi. A hi-fi, do you? It's computer lingo. Computer? I'm sorry, computer, I'm losing you altogether, Red. Do we have is any other with callers? Uh, no. I, 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 I think I, I have a question. <laughs> I'm uh, James from East York. Um, all the other hockey teams are going to high-powered mathematics analytics looking at things like shots for and shots against. I don't read any of that stuff in any of your columns. Why not? Hey, the only math that matters is you score one more goal than the other team. You can pitch all the rest of it, whatever that stuff is. <laughs> I believe that we're uh, fresh out of time. <laughs> I'm fresh out of ad libs. That's all right. <laughs> Mercifully, we are out of time. Thank you for joining us on yet another edition of the Sports Hunt. Give it up to the press box players. Scarlett, your big column box. E. Victor Chino, right down here. George Gross, Brian Coggins. Bill Dunnell, Kevin Green. Jim Sandin, Johnny Esau. And David Schultz is Red Yard.
I'm Gary Price, I'm going to go to the flip. Oh, yeah. Can we get a quick hand for Gary Joyce because she's brilliant. And it's, it's only